Well, uh, our Porter family came to the Dry Hill area south of Watertown in 1938. My father was a very good cowman, and so that was his emphasis of the farm, and it continued uh, as we expanded. And over the years, farming has gone from a small family farm, and in our case, a very large family farm. But the family is the whole focus of what we do. Growing on a farm and, and being able to see what you did every day, whether that was planting the crops or milking the cows or, or building, building the fence or building the barns, you got to see what you did at the end of the day. And th that's something that really, you know, it's hard to learn at a nine to five type, type job. Dinner conversations tend to be about the farm. Uh, holiday conversations tend to be about the farm and it just kind of gets in all our blood and, and that's what we're passionate about. Nowadays uh, the larger dairies are, are, are highly regulated and nutrient management plans are, are a very big part of that regulation from the environmental side. Everything you know that we do is is based on a statistic or a number and science behind it and then we have to follow those rules and regulations in order to be compliant with our current environmental plan. So the, some of the concepts behind what drove the regulations that were initially put out in 1999 had to do with pretty much uh, activity in the late 80s and early 1990s when a farm in western New York was uh, sued by neighbors. The lawsuit focused on manure applications and um, gro farms growing, having more manure to spread, requiring more land to do that, to recycle those nutrients um, properly, and uh, it got the attention of more neighbors. So the regulations came about because the public wanted to assure themselves that farms, all farms, were managing it uh, appropriately. It's made us, number one, as farmers, responsible for our actions, but it's also helped us become more efficient and more, uh, more profitable in the long run. The permit, again, requires a third-party certified planner to evaluate the farmstead for sources of pollution. So that's the farmstead component. There's also a field component, so all the lands that that operation rents or owns and operates and applies manure to uh, must have a fairly uh, significant and complicated set of uh, nutrient management, a nutrient management plan applied to uh, those lands. So yearly we sit down with our planner and review the amount of manure that can be applied each year on each field. Then we take that information and we'll sit with, whether it's a crop consultant or an extension agronomist, and we come up with a, a plan as to how much, how much nutrients we might be shy in terms of what that crop requires, or if we need any, uh, perhaps manure itself is all that's required for that particular field for a particular crop. The decision of when to spread manure is very important and farmers take this very seriously. Having manure storage um, allows that farm to apply manure in a more timely fashion in relation to when the crops are able to receive it and hopefully when the weather is uh, and the soils are in better condition. We, we learned early on that Manure was good for the land. We might not always have known why, but the fields that received manure always grew a little better crop. As the herd grew, it became a bigger and bigger challenge to spread that manure on a daily basis, especially in inclement weather, whether it's a blizzard of 77 or uh, rainfall. You, you, know, you, you didn't want to be getting stuck all the time. So storages became a necessity for us as we got bigger to avoid uh, having to fight the weather. And as we learned more and more about the value manure, it became a bigger part of our operation as we grew because that manure was no longer a waste product, but a valuable product. So one of the challenges that we face as, as dairy producers is 
the amount of time that we have, the window that we have in the spring or fall to get the manure on the fields. In reality, there's like six weeks that we're, we have to get that manure out, incorporate it into the soil, and then plant the crop. I think most of us as farmers, you know, we would all love to have um, 30, 40 cows and, and, and milk them and have a white picket fence. But as the farms have gotten larger, um, we've had to adapt and change with the times. And some of those changes have led to having manure storages as we become bigger. Manure storage allows the farms to focus their labor and their management uh, and to make optimal decisions about recycling the manure nutrients. It's, it's, it's very common to have two to three years of planning put into those structures by certified engineers, uh, by our, our CAFO planners. Uh, most of the research that we use just on the farm either comes from Cornell or Penn State or Wisconsin. And all of those factors, what type of storage to build, how big, uh, how much rainfall we get in a year, all of those things really go into the planning of, of size, scope, and scale of, of these structures. When we look for a location for manure storage, not only do we look for the land base that it's going to be utilized in, but also where it lies with respect to the surrounding area. Uh, which way the wind blows, uh, which way the traffic would come in to load it and to unload it, um, how it might be utilized in the, in the landscape, and then how it fits in as far as uh, the community. To determine if the soil is suitable, we end up doing test pits to look at the, uh, the type of soil, the plasticity of it, and pretty much looking at how impermeable we can make it with compactive effort. If the soil is not suitable for an earthen manure storage, then we go to different structure types. And so we can either use a polyethylene uh, liner, which is impermeable, we can put that in a, uh, based on an earthen one, or we can go to a concrete or a steel structure. On all of these structures, they are designed by a professional engineer utilizing the standards of the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and the engineer has to certify that. This, of course, is a professional engineer, and they go through a certification process as well. Um, one of their, the ethics of a professional engineer is to look out for the health and safety of the public, and so each design is looked at to make sure that it will not fail. So once the design is completed, um, the farm reviews it, we get a contractor, uh, and then as it is constructed, we apply construction inspection to make sure that as it's being built, everything that the design is called for is there. If issues come up, they can be addressed, uh, that it might be uncovered during the construction process, and to make sure that in the end, that uh, design, that completed project can be certified as meeting the standards. In a municipal system, they discharge the, the treated effluent into the water where farms recycle the nutrients to the land. So the, the dairy farm cycle is, uh, is, uh, is, is a really beautiful situation. The uh, cows are making milk, obviously, for human consumption. Um, the farmers growing crops that feed the cows, and then the manure that's a byproduct of milk production is then used to feed the crops. So for us in general, uh, we start in the spring uh, by loading tractor trailers and, and we spread those tractor trailers, land apply those tractor trailers on the fields that are dry, uh, maybe don't have as big of hills and, and we can get on them. We also transfer manure from tractor trailers to tank spreaders and it's very common for us to inject the manure directly into the ground uh, with those tank spreaders. And, uh, it does a couple things. It, it really keeps the odor down, but it also decreases the, the chance or risk of runoff. Uh, the third way that we like to apply manure in the spring is with a drag line system, drag hose system. And the amount of manure that can be applied in a short, shortest period of time uh, with the least compaction to the soil is really drag line. And, and that's really gained uh, popularity in the last decade. So once we're done with drag lining, we go right into planting our crops, our corn, or our new seed and alfalfa. So after we cut first cutting, we generally like to apply manure within two to three days after cutting 
Uh, we try to use as big equipment as we can to get in and get off the ground, causing the least the least compaction to the soil and, and, and really the least exposure to neighbors. Uh, after second and third cutting, uh, we go right into chopping corn. Enter into the fall season, certainly manure is still being applied on the fields. And many times it's in conjunction with a cover crop, whether it's rye or winter wheat, something along that line. Or it's just a matter of building up your other nutrients such as phosphorus or potassium that stays in the soil and is not uh, leached out nearly as quickly as perhaps nitrogen. This is all a drive to utilize nutrients more effectively. Being able to hold, store them up and put them out at a time when the land is better able to receive and recycle the nutrients. The only way to manage this process effectively is to have manure storage. So when it comes down to it, if you're going to have animals, you're going to have some waste. And ultimately, in a perfect world, is we find a way to maximize the utilization of that waste product. For us as dairy farmers, it, that manure does have a lot of value to us. And ultimately, I'd love to see uh, some technology come along that we're able to only use manure and not have to buy any fertilizer. Manure storages have allowed us to maximize and utilize the value of that waste product. It's, it's just the direction that we have to go to stay in business. In fact, most of my life, the things we did was to survive within the industry, uh, to be more efficient. It is uh, it's part of our stewardship on the farm is to, is to take care of all that we have, whether it's uh, animals or whether it's land. I mean, they don't make any more land. And we happen to have some very uh, fertile land that we like to uh, increase that fertility uh, so that we can grow a greater abundance of crop on the land. You know, there'll be more and more regulations, and those regulations are the, for the good of the public and the community and the, and the farmer himself. We really hope that we can make a compromise with the public and the regulators that, you know, the farms will be able to continue to be in business and, and as the surrounding rural areas uh, keep growing and there's more and more people that are coming closer to agriculture, that somewhere in the middle, you know, we can all find a, a solid ground and move forward together.